Welcome to Whole Life Insurance Mechanics from the perspective of Nelson Nash's Infinite Banking Concept. I'm Ryan Griggs, and this is part two of our seven part series. This one is on policy infrastructure. Here's our overview. We're gonna start with the base policy. The base policy is essentially the foundation of all dividend paying whole life insurance products. Then we'll get to PUA or paid up additions. Sometimes people will, will say paid up additional insurance, but PUA premium. Part three is a brief introduction to dividends. I'll give you a little chart about how uh, base and PUA compare with one another. And that'll prepare us to state specifically what the four sources of cash value growth are. And I think, like I said, in the introductory lecture, if you can understand this, a lot will follow, a lot will make more sense. And I cover this kind of stuff with every client. If you can understand why cash value grows the way it does, you know, <laughs> you're ahead of a lot of agents. <laughs> and then we'll end with some initial implications. All right, the base policy. Base premium uh, puts in force what we call an initial death benefit. Okay, so lots of terminology here. This in force language means causes to be in effect. Okay, instantiates obligates to be paid, it puts in force. Uh, so I have here that an in, an in force death benefit is a future cash flow. This is gonna become important, this idea of a future cash flow. Right? It's a cash flow paid at some point in the future. And the life insurance company is contractually obligated to pay that future cash flow so long as the policy owner, probably you watching, so long as the policy owner is paying their base premiums. Because in, in reality, base premiums is, is a schedule of expected future premiums. We, and we, we get, we get kind of loose with the language. Right? I, oh, I paid my base premium. Or I've got a base premium payment coming up. Right? We, might refer to, we might be referring to the base premium due for that policy year. We might be referring to one month's share of the annually paid base premium. Okay. Or if we take the you know 30,000 foot highest level, which we're at here, base premium is really a schedule of payments from now, from the time the policy goes in force until some date in the future. The end point at which base premium is no longer payable is what we call the paid up year or the paid up age. Okay. And initial, and when I say paid up, just, nobody uses that language. <laughs> a better phrase would be paid for. Okay, you go to Walmart, you buy a TV, you pay 500 bucks, you get the TV. Well, that television is paid for, right? No future payments are required for you to maintain ownership of that television. In contrast, you can think of like, I have a truck sitting out in the driveway, right? The, if you have payments on a, on a, on a car or a truck, well, that truck isn't fully paid for, right? Future payments are required to maintain ownership. And so de the initial death benefit is not fully paid for until the end of that schedule of base premium payments. Okay. So we say that base premium is payable from day one of the policy right away, right at the right when the policy is purchased until when that initial death benefit is paid up. And the way we refer to the that endpoint of that schedule of base premium payments is typically, though not always, by the age of the insured. So a policy that's paid up at 100 is one where base premium is payable from day one of the contract until the policy year in which the policy owner turns age 100. Uh, there are others uh, paid up, let's say paid up at age 95, there might be 75, it might be 65, and so forth. Now, other times, we'll refer to a, what's called a limited pay. A limited pay policy, for example, a, a 10 pay, or a, let's say, a, a 20 pay. These are limited pay 
policies, by which we mean base premium is payable for 10 or for 20 years. Okay, so I have a 10 pay policy. That's a policy that's gonna accept a base premium for per year for 10 years. And these are in the IBC world, the 10 pay, 20 pay, the limited pay stuff is uh, less popular for reasons we'll get into down the line. Uh, we typically will refer to policies that are paid up at a certain age of the insured. And this is what we mean by the base policy, right? The base premium and the initial death benefit that that base premium puts in force. Okay, that was a lot of words. <laughs> so now we're gonna draw pretty pictures and you're going to forgive me for my lack of artistic talent. Okay, on the left here, we have the policy start time. That can be whenever. And then we're gonna draw a line out to the right and it will end certainly at some point at the latest, at the latest time in the life cycle of a dividend paying whole life policy is what we call the year of endowment. At the year of endowment, which in the United States is age 121, if you are listening from Canada, the year of endowment, as I understand it, uh, as of this recording is age one, 100. But at the year of endowment, if, if the insured were to live beyond age 121, then death benefit would be paid. It still gets paid, but it would go to the policy owner. Okay, so in a sense, if you outlive your life insurance, if you outlive the whole life policy, death benefit will still get paid. Uh, it'll just go to the owner instead of the beneficiary. If that does happen, uh, and again, I'm not a tax advisor, but this is an income taxable event. Okay, so it's okay <laughs> for, for you to pass away while your policy's in force, meaning before the age 121. Now, of course, if you get to 121, there's gonna be plenty of death benefit, you can pay the tax, but you know, we all pay enough taxes, let's put it that way. Okay, so that's the year of endowment. On the last slide, I said that uh, base premium is payable from day one until the initial death benefit is paid up. We also will say, and you'll hear this online, that up the, when the policy is paid up, okay, that's fine. You know, I know we, well, maybe we do know what you mean, maybe we don't, but a policy is paid up when the initial death benefit is fully paid for. A policy is paid up when you've completed your schedule of base premium payments. That's when the policy, really the initial death benefit is fully paid for or paid up. And in this last example, we talked about uh, age 100. Okay, so base premium then in this, uh, you know, Da Vinci mosaic here is payable from the time the policy goes in force through this artistic squiggly line up until age 100. And so there's annual base premium payments. Now, base, these base premium payments are uh, payable at a premium mode. And this is the case uh, across essentially all life insurance companies. A premium mode is the frequency at which base premium payments are made. Uh, uh, they are, there's typically four options. You can pick, choose from annual, semi-annual. There's also quarterly and monthly. Most people will choose either annual or monthly. Life insurance is priced assuming that base premiums are received up front, meaning annually, meaning at the beginning of a policy year. If you're going to pay more frequently throughout the year because of the time value of money, because a dollar received in month 10 is not the same as a dollar received in month one, there's essentially a, a time value of money factor to consider. What this means is that for a given base premium payment, if that base premium payment is paid annually, it will put in force more death benefit, more initial death benefit than if that base premium payment were paid more frequently. Okay, so $50,000 in base premium paid annually is gonna buy m marginally more initial death benefit than 50 grand in base premium paid 
monthly, for instance. Okay. How much different? It's going to vary by your age, by the company. It's all over the place. But you know, expect somewhere in the neighborhood of you know four to eight percent, five to ten percent. Uh, in my opinion, it's not enough to change your world. Right? If you, my clients, about half my clients pay annually. Let's put it that way. And the ones who start monthly transition to annually. Okay. In fact, I did this with my own policies. Uh, I have three policies. The first one was could have been much, much better. It was before I knew anything about whole life insurance design. The second two I built myself, <laughs> so they're better. Uh, and on those, I uh, the, of the one I'm thinking in particular, I started monthly and I switched to annual. Yeah, but if you have the cash on hand, you just start annual. It's marginally more efficient, put it that way. Anyway, base premium is paid at a premium mode, and it's paid across the nice squiggle line that you see going from policy start to age 100 when, in this example, the initial death benefit is paid up. Okay, so then whenever, you know, it, suppose uh, the policy owner were to pass away after age 100, but between age 121. If that were the case, let's have a nice straight line, Griggs. If that were the case, then death benefit would be paid to what we call a beneficiary. And there may be more than one beneficiary. And you can split up how you want the death benefit to be paid uh, across one or, more po uh, one or more parties by percentages. And you might also name what are called contingent beneficiaries. A contingent beneficiary is one where uh, is one to whom death benefit will be paid in the event that the primary beneficiary has graduated. Okay, so if you outlive your primary beneficiary and you've named a contingent beneficiary, then the uh, death benefit will be paid to that contingent beneficiary. And there can be more than one. Uh, policy owner is the one who gets to name who the beneficiary and contingent beneficiaries are, and you can change them after the policy is in force. And it's a good idea to make sure they're correct. Right? When you buy your first, your, when you buy your contract, you and you know you may never change it. If you're married and you name your husband or your wife, well then maybe that never changes. Uh, but if you know, I have a, I, I've had many clients who they bought insurance uh, prior to getting married, and so they'll change their beneficiary later. And just because in this example, I assume that. The you know graduation, the death of the insured happens after age 100. It doesn't have to. You know it could happen during the time in which uh, you know uh, prior to the the year in which the policy is paid up. And if that were to happen, well then of course the death benefit would just get paid to the beneficiary at that time. Okay, that's your base policy. That's how. Uh, that's the initial foundation, the, initial, the base premium and the initial death benefit in a uh, very beautiful <laughs> drawing. Okay, paid up addition. PUA premium buys incremental uh, additional paid up death benefit that we then add to the initial death benefit. And that's why I've compartmentalized this the way I have, right? That's why we covered base premium. There, in fact, on the online portal, so almost all companies, not all, but almost all companies now will offer the client uh, an online portal, It'll give you a username and login. And so you can log in, you can check the various values. You can check your death benefit, check your cash values, check your loan value, and it, like your outstanding policy loan balances and, and so forth. On that, in fact, with my clients, I give them like a key term sheet. It's like <laughs> essentially like a vocab sheet that you used to get in high school that sort of decodes the insurance terminology. Uh, so like down here at the bottom, well, let's say, let's put it this way. On the online portal, it might say, you know, your base policy death benefit. And then it might say, you know, is such and such. And then it'll say maybe your PUA or your paid up death benefit is such and such okay uh, your your total death benefit down here is the sum of all those things 
And I just say that because once you get your policy or if you already have one, you can log in and, and you'll see this. So different companies have different terminology, but this is essentially uh, what's going on. So that, you know, if I pay 10,000 in PUA premium, maybe that adds 20,000 of new additional incremental death benefit onto the policy. Now that new $20,000 in death benefit is fully paid for. It's paid up, right? Meaning that in the future, I won't have to pay another premium of any amount in order to keep that new $20,000 in death benefit on the contract, in force on the contract. That's what we mean by a paid up additions or a PUA premium payment. We're buying additional death benefit that's fully paid for. I say here that there are generally two sources. One is out of pocket. So like uh, becoming your own banker, part four, equipment financing, the PUA premium there is 25 grand a year. Right? That's how much the, po the policy owner could pay. And in the first four years of five of those six illustrations, in fact, does pay. It's 25,000 in PUA per year for the first four years. PUA can come from another source though. It can come from the dividend. Dividends are non-guaranteed. We'll talk about dividends in a moment. But the recommended allocation, the recommended destination for that dividend is PUA, right? So in a given year, you'll pay PUA out of your own pocket. At the end of the year, a dividend is paid to the policy owner. And in the event that that dividend is allocated to destined for PUA, there will be some end of year PUA. Uh, that's coming separately from the dividend, not out of your own pocket. I get a question a lot of times, does the PUA coming from the dividend affect my ability to pay PUA? And the answer is generally no. Okay, there can be situations where the, the death benefit purchased by the PUA from the dividend uh, is so much, and, and the, the structure of the contract is so mangled that if you were to pay PUA, that it would cause a mech. But in my world, okay, in my world, that's not the case. The, 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 the PUA that comes from the dividend does not affect your out-of-pocket ability to pay PUA. And that's why I say that generally speaking, there's two sources. You gotta understand, y'all, this is coming from my method. So I'm not speaking for other agents, I'm not speaking for other structures or other companies. This is, but this is generally true. Let's put it that way. And then, like I say here, the total death benefit on a policy is, you know, the initial death benefit that the base premiums puts in force, right? That's what's yet to be paid up. But the initial death benefit isn't paid up until you've reached the schedule, the end of the schedule of expected future base premiums, plus whatever additional death benefit that is paid up, right? That's what's coming from PUA. And then any temporary uh, death benefit that may come from a term rider and term we'll get to in the future. For now, we're just talking about PUA, but there are, you know, death benefit can come from other sources too. And like we did with base, we'll draw, you know, another Monet here. I think it was Da Vinci last time, now it's Monet. All right, policy start is on the left. We go out to the right. This is the year again of endowment. Uh, in the U.S., age 121, we have a, a year where the policy, <laughs> see that language? We have a year where the initial death benefit is paid up, what we'll often say that the policy becomes paid up. Uh, we used age 100 last time. Let's use age 95. This time, we know that base premium payment is payable from the time the policy goes in force until the year in which that initial death benefit is paid up. And so there may be, you know, PUA premium payments where these X's are. So that might be PUA one and then another another PUA two. And then we'll get all the way, you know, we'll complete multiple PUAs over time. And I'll just abbreviate that with PUA N. Okay. So multiple PUA premium payments. These every single one of these PUA premiums 
is causing the death benefit to increase. And the more PUA premiums I pay, the more the death benefit goes up. Right. So just because, uh, just because base premium, I'm sorry, just because PUA premium buys paid up death benefit doesn't mean that you can't make multiple PUA premiums, right? Of course you can. And in fact, that would be encouraged. <laughs> okay. All right. Got to talk about dividends because we've talked about PUA. So we'll touch back on dividends into the future. For now, uh, just a little brief introduction here to dividends. Economically, understand that a dividend is compensation for ownership. That's what a dividend is, period. The IRS will say that for, uh, life, in for life insurance purchased from a mutual company, a dividend is technically a return of premium, a, a much maligned phrase, right? The, the, because again, a, a mutual company is owned by its policy owners. There's not, there's not a profit that's going to be distributed to shareholders. Okay, and, and to the IRS that you know, knows about as much economics as my dog Lucy over there, uh, <laughs> the, because there's no profit that's distributed to shareholders, to them it's like it, 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 it causes brain freeze to think of a dividend in the context of a mutual company. And so the, the IRS will say that, well, a dividend in mutual life insurance is just a return of premium. And then consumer advocates like Ralph Nader and others will say that, oh, they're, uh, you know, they're o the company's overcharging for the death. They're charging you too much for the death benefit. It's like, yeah, okay, or or in reality, the actuaries, the engineers that design these policies, what they're really doing is they're overestimating their costs for the year and they're underestimating the performance of their investments. Hmm. Maybe that's why it's so foreign to these uh, government entities and these state-funded professors. Uh, <laughs> the idea of uh, wise financial and business practice. <laughs> where we might want to think conservatively so that at the end of a given fiscal year, at the end of a, at the year, we've got a surplus. Now it's a mutual company, so we can't call that profit. Profit's evil anyway, right? So we'll, we'll say it's a financial surplus and that surplus is gonna be distributed to policy owners. You know, you wanna call a return a premium, call it whatever you want. Okay, just pay me a dividend, how about that? Uh, and these dividends can be allocated, okay? allocated in different ways, meaning they can go to different things. The industry calls this a dividend election. Okay, the default dividend election is PUA. That's why I said earlier that there's two sources of PUA. This is sort of the tie-in here to the PUA discussion with dividends is that the default dividend election in the world of IBC is PUA. So every year in the event a dividend is paid, again, they're non-guaranteed. That's why we work with companies that have paid a dividend for at least 100 consecutive years. The default election for that dividend in the event that it's paid is PUA. There's others though. Okay, the, you can tell the company, look, you can hold, keep the dividend in a segregated account, a segregated account at the life insurance company where, where it will, uh, generate taxable interest you can tell the policy owner can tell the company look send it to me as cash you can tell the company uh use the dividend to offset my premium and if, in the event that you have a loan balance outstanding you can tell the company to use the dividend to pay down outstanding policy loans uh, we'll get into more on dividend elections at a future lecture uh, for now just understand that one source of PUA uh, is from the dividend in the event that it's paid. Here's our little summary chart, contrasting base and PUA premium. So we know our base premium instantiates or puts in force the initial death benefit. And we know that PUA in contrast 
buys incrementally more. I say incrementally because I'm not. I'm trying to not use the same word that's in the thing I'm trying to define, right? But you get it. We're adding more death benefit. Base premium is payable at a premium mode. Annually, semi-annually, quarterly, monthly. That's the case throughout the industry, and regardless of company. And it's going to be paid until the initial death benefit is paid up. So there's a schedule of payments out into the future. Whereas PUA premium is just a one-time payment. There's no schedule. Right, let, me be, let me be precise. For the death benefit that a PUA premium purchases, there is no schedule of future expected payments. Okay, that doesn't mean that you can't make multiple PUA payments. Now, I know as soon as somebody sees this, they're going to say, well, there's premium mode there on the left. Why isn't there premium mode on the right? Well, I'm trying to keep this simple here. There, some companies accept PUA premium uh, throughout the year, meaning not at a certain premium mode, not at a certain frequency. Other companies require PUA premium to be paid at the same premium mode. That can differ. And you might ask yourself, well, which would I want? Do I want to be restricted as to when I can pay PUA or would I like more freedom? You might be able to tell what my opinion is. <laughs> Base premium will generate little to no cash value in the initial years. Okay, and we're going to get into, what, in, into the cash value growth factors here in a moment. We're going to explain this third line. But PUA premium does generate substantial cash value early on. How much cash value? It's about dollar for dollar. I pay 10 grand in PUA premium. That adds 20 grand, let's say, in death benefit. And that'll generate around 10 grand in cash value. How quickly? Uh, the dollar for dollar thing will obtain by the end of the year. And I pay 10 grand in PUA. That adds 20 grand in initial death benefit. You know, maybe within. 30 to 60 days, I've got 90% of that PUA payment in cash value. So in this case, nine grand. And by the end of the year, it'll catch up to that 10. And nowadays, excuse me, nowadays it, it'll be a bit more than that. But be conservative. It's okay to be conservative, dollar for dollar, let's say. Uh, base premium is required to keep the policy in force. Sometimes like in my writing on my blog, I'll say that base premium is obligatory. Look, this is private contract, okay? A unilateral contract that you own. You're not obligated to do anything, okay? But if we assume you want to keep the policy in force, then base premium is obligatory. But I should be more careful about the language. That's why I put here required, it's required to keep the policy in force. It's obligatory insofar as you want to keep the contract <laughs> in force, insofar as you want to keep death benefit payable. Okay. Whereas PUA premium is not required to keep the policy in force. Of course, you're not going to get the associated benefits that come with PUA premium if you don't pay it, but the policy will stay in force. All right, cash value. This is about as technical as it's going to get actuarially speaking because uh, we're going to get into present valuation just conceptually okay? i'm an economist not a mathematician <laughs> uh, this will be important terminology when i talk about present values we'll abbreviate it pv and remember this terminology of a future cash flow okay that's death benefit and by the way if you see this little beige thing walking around in the background that's a um, my dog, my big great Dane Lucy, who's coming off some not feeling too good, but that's what's going on in the background if you're watching and you see that. All right, so PV is present value, uh, future cash flow, FCF. That's essentially death benefit, right? But here we're just we're going to talk about future cash flow. So follow me in this example. Let's say that I promise you that in one year from now. If you present this little piece of paper to me, this little sticky note to me, uh, then I'll pay you 10 grand. And so we can think of $10,000 payable in a year from now, a future cash flow 
of $10,000. Well, if we did that, we might say, or you might say, look, I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait a year to get the 10 grand. Maybe somebody else is willing to wait to get 10 grand. And maybe, in fact, they're willing uh, to pay me some amount of money in order to get the 10 grand in a year. So you might find someone who's willing to pay you, let's say, $9,000. Okay. Someone's willing to wait. Well, someone's willing to give up nine grand now in order to wait a year and collect 10000 in one year. Right? They'll have a gain of $1,000. They'll have to wait a year, but you know, maybe somebody's well capitalized and they're willing to do that. In that case, we might say that the present value of this 10 grand in one year is $9,000. Right? That's what the 10000 in one year from now is worth today if you turned around and sold this to that other individual. Okay, So we have the idea of a present value of a future cash flow. Now let's add a little wrinkle. Let's say instead of 10 grand, you know, I won't, this little piece of paper now is not a claim to 10 grand in a year from now. This little paper says, look, I'll pay you 10 grand in a year from now so long as you pay me 500 per month. $500 per month until then. In other words, we can assume an ongoing cost associated with this future cash flow. Okay. In that case, then, we, we introduce this terminology of a net present value. Right? The present value of a future cash flow net of the ongoing cost. And so if you were to try to uh, sell this little piece of pay, you don't want to wait the year to collect the 10 and you don't want to pay the 500 per month, but maybe somebody else is. Well, now maybe someone else, knowing that someone, else, knowing that they not only have to wait a year, but they also have to make sure they pay this 500 per month. Well, now maybe they're certainly going to pay you less. Okay, so maybe they'll pay you, let's say, two thousand dollars. So we can use this terminology of a net, the net present value of ten thousand dollars in one year. Now understand we've accounted for the, the 500 per month in this net, right? The, so the net present value, the present value of $10,000 in one year, net of the $500 per, per month is in this example, $2,000. Of course, the net present value is gonna be lower than just the present value where we had no assumed ongoing cost because the, the person buying the thing is gonna be responsible for the $500 a month. All right. So the concept here is a future cash flow, 10 grand in one year, an ongoing cost, let's say $500 per month, and then the net present value of that future cash flow, the present value of the future cash flow net of the 500 per month. Okay. So if you can understand these concepts of present value, net present value, a future cash flow, and an ongoing cost, you've got everything you need to understand why cash value grows the way it does in life insurance. In other words, in the example, you know, I said that, you know, we have a future cash flow of 10 grand. In life insurance, that's death benefit. Okay. And what the death benefit is worth today that's cash value. By the way, the ongoing cost in the example, that's base premium. Right? It's the ongoing cost associated with the initial death benefit. So just to summarize, the cash value in dividend paying whole life insurance is what the death benefit is worth today, net of future expected costs, net of the base premiums. This is why cash value can be called cash surrender value or even just surrender value. Okay, in the example, I said, look, somebody else might be willing to buy this little piece of paper off you. In the world of life insurance, that somebody else is the life insurance company. The life insurance company is telling you, look, 
if you don't want us to pay this death benefit when you pass away, uh, great. <laughs> well, you can surrender the policy and we'll pay you what that death benefit is worth right now. So surrender value, cash value, same thing, cash surrender value. Now, the important thing to realize here, one of the important things is that cash value is a function of the death benefit. Okay, there's in, in the world of IBC, we really neglect death benefit. We seem to have missed the idea that there is no cash value unless there's a death benefit. The cash value is just what the death benefit is worth today. If there's no death benefit, there is no cash value. James will make the point that at age 121, at the year of endowment, the, the cash value will equal the death benefit. In a sense, that's when present value and future cash flow are equal because we're at the time of that future cash flow. I think that's why cash value will equal the death benefit at age 121, at the latest possible time in the life cycle of a policy. And so he'll make the point, well, do you want a high death benefit or do you want a low death benefit? Right? To illustrate the, the idea of, well, do you want higher cash value late in life or do you want lower cash value? And there's this idea online, you know, the, the, the statement, um, I want dividend paying whole life insurance for the IBC with as little death benefit as possible and as much cash value as possible. That's an incoherent statement. And, you know, the questions people ask, is, are, it can be very revealing. I, I know what stuff someone's watching if they if in their introductory message to me, they say that. See that? Yeah, it doesn't work. Okay, so that's what cash value is. It's what the death benefit is worth today. Of course, net of those future base premiums. Just like the ten just like the two thousand dollars is what the ten grand in a year from now net of the five hundred per month is worth today. So let's summarize this and add another layer with some some uh, terminology. Why does cash value grow? Let me make this a little bit bigger. Why does cash value grow? What are the four growth factors? Well, the first that's often overlooked is time. Right? It's what it's worth today. There's waiting. We have to wait. That waiting time is well. It's not well. The time value of money is what we call interest. Whoops. Not so big, goodness. Okay, and you know, look, if I, in the example I said 10 grand in a year from now, right, that was the framing of the, of the example. But what if it was 10 grand in six months from now? Well, now somebody else, if you were to try to sell that piece of paper to somebody, well, now they don't have to wait a year. They only have to wait six months. Okay, and be, so so now maybe they're willing to pay more because they don't have to wait as long. Right, and the the inverse of that is you would you, maybe you're willing to to give up the your claim to that future cash flow for less money because the waiting time is longer. Okay, put differently again. The, the more we go through time, the higher the present value of a future cash flow becomes. Okay, put differently again, the shorter the time period over which we're performing a present valuation uh, calculation, the shorter the time period, the higher the present values. So all less equal in this, really in this, uh, whoops, in this present value uh, component, the th there's a time factor and if that period of time between now and that future cash flow if that period of time between now and that future cash flow is going down the value of the claim to that future cash flow must be going up 
So as the uh, as the duration, as the time uh, over which we're discounting decreases, cash value must be rising. Okay, so does, by the way, this is why life insurance companies can say that cash value will grow guaranteed. Okay, it's not a marketing thing. Essentially what they're saying is that, well, <laughs> whether they know that they're saying this or, <laughs> or not, is so somebody's figured it out, is that so long as time is passing, cash value must be rising. And it has to be that way because the present value of future cash flows rise as time goes by. I hope that's clear. All right, then base premium. Base premium is another reason for cash value to go. And, you know, people will say this online, you know, uh, base premium buys insurance and PUA premium buys cash as if base premium does not contribute as if base premium payment does not contribute to cash value growth. Wrong. Wrong. In year one and in year two, maybe it's the case that base premium does not cause cash value growth. But over time, like if you had a policy where the only premium payment was base, there was never PUA, uh, there was never dividends, cash value would accumulate in a base only policy. Now it's gonna accumulate a lot slower, no question, but even in dividend paying whole life with base only premium, payment of the base premium does cause cash value to rise. Why is that? Well, remember, base premium is the cost associated with that future cash flow. If I decrease the cost, if I uh, make good on those expected future payments, if I'm decreasing the drag, if I'm decreasing the weight on that future cash flow, then that future, then the present value of that future cash flow must be rising. For instance, if we go back to the example, and I say, uh, you know, look, it's uh, ten grand payable in a year from now, but you've and you, but you've got to pay me five hundred dollars per month starting in month seven. Right. In other words, we might assume a, a a lower ongoing requirement. We might assume a lower cost associated with the future cash flow. If we did that, what would happen to the present value? Well, it would go up because if somebody else was going to buy that piece of paper, now they're not responsible for the 500 per month from day one. Right? They don't have to pay that anymore. They only have to pay 500 per month from months seven through 12. Okay, and so you consequently can require more money up front to give up that claim. Maybe the maybe it goes from uh, 2,500 to three, to, you know, 3,500. So base premium payment causes this net part, this this weight, this drag on that future cash flow to decrease. And because the cost associated with that future cash flow is going down, this must cause cash value to rise. And we'll put here again, this is the cost associated with the future cash flow. And then of course, PUA. PUA comes from two places, out of pocket and from the dividend. And in both of these cases, what we're affecting is the death benefit, right? I'm increasing the magnitude of a future cash flow. I'm increasing what that death benefit will be put our arrows here. I'm increasing what that death benefit will be. By the way, without adding future cost. Again, PUA premium, paid up additional. I'm getting additional death benefit that's fully paid for. In other words, I'm not adding to that schedule of yet to be paid premiums. Not even touching that, right? That that's the base, the whole other thing. So I'm increasing the magnitude of the future cash flow. I'm increasing the death benefit without adding to the cost. So this must mean that with PUA premium, I'm increasing cash value. All right, so why does cash value grow? Well, the passage of time, 
right? Cash value is a function of time. It's, a, it's, it's the result of present valuation. And as time spans decrease, the present values of future cash flows must rise. Reason number two, pay, payment of base premium. As I pay my base premium, I'm, I'm decreasing that outstanding schedule of future expected premiums. Right, that, that schedule is fully unpaid from at day one. But as soon as I start making base premiums, I, I whittle down that schedule of, of future base premiums and that decrease in cost, that lightening on lightening of the weight on that future cash flow, the decreasing of the cost on that future death benefit, as that goes down, the present value, the cash value must go up. Number three. PUA out of my own pocket. I'm increasing the death benefit without adding additional cost. So that must cause uh, cash value to go up. And same thing with PUA from the dividend. Okay, so the, you know, the, the cash value growth here from factors one and two uh, is slow at first. Whereas cash value growth from points three and four is relatively immediate. Okay, but just because passage of time and payment of base premium has a slower, you know, takes more time to really manifest, in, you know, in, in terms of what we see in cash value, doesn't mean it's not there. Okay. <laughs> it's still there. In fact, as, like I said earlier, the passage of time is, is why we can say that cash value must grow guaranteed. <clears throat> Some implications, just to get your mind going here. Okay. In Equipment Financing in Becoming Your Own Banker, Part 4, Nelson assumes that the base premium beginning in year five is paid by the dividend. And people miss that for some reason. So catch me on that. The and Nelson assumes that year five and beyond, until the initial death benefit's paid up, age 65, that the dividend is is what's responsible for the base premium. But remember, I said that, and he even acknowledges this in the book, that the dividend ought to go to PUA. So if instead, uh, Nelson's nephew, his logger nephew in North Carolina, that's who, by the way, that section of the book is uh, modeled on. If he had paid the base premium himself, that 15 grand per year himself, out of his own pocket uh, and the dividend therefore were allowed to go back into the policy in the form of PUA, that would have caused all the numbers to be bigger, right? Cash values and death benefits would have gone up. And I know as soon as someone's watching this, they're gonna say, well, the dividend in the early years wasn't big enough to pay the base premium. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Okay, it was through a combination of dividends and a uh, partial surrender, what we call a premium offset. We'll get there. My point is that the dividend was directed to the base premium in that example. If it had been left at the default uh, preferred recommended allocation, then cash values would have gone up. So when and this kind of answers question number two here, where should the dividend go? It should go to PUA. There are, the, the reason I say this will be a big deal later, especially in the case study lecture, is that there are, so, there are certain riders, the premium for which uh, the companies expect to come from the dividend. Yeah, certain term riders, we'll, we'll get into that. For now, the recommendation is PUA. Ultimately, if the dividend is going to PUA, which is increasing death benefit and cash value, then the dividend is contributing to my ongoing compounding growth. Right, and that word compounding, that boy, that word compounding gets thrown a lot. Right, understand that the only financial asset where we can legitimately talk about compounding is in dividend paying whole life insurance. Compounding requires annual, positive, uninterrupted growth. Any negative change, any decrease, any reduction in the amount or number of whatever we're talking about halts compounding. So people talk about compounding 
in the stock market. <laughs> it's like, yeah, if you carefully select the number of years over which you're looking, okay. But of course, if you look at the annual change in the S&P 500 or the Dow, you name it, there's down years. Okay, well, that interrupts compounding. Everybody talks about compounding. It's so great. It is. But there are not many places. Think of the number. Think of the asset classes wherein the value of those assets grows every year. Guaranteed. Yeah. yeah it's called dividend paying whole life. I mentioned this comment, this idea that PUA buys cash and base buys death benefit or base buys insurance. It's totally incoherent. The only reason PUA premium buys cash, generates cash value, is because it buys death benefit. <laughs> and by the way, the payment of base premium over time generates cash value. <laughs> so it, it, that's, this statement is wrong on like two, three, four levels. It's just not, not only does PUA premium buy death benefit, but it only buys death benefit. I'm sorry, not only does PUA premium buy death benefit, but the only reason PUA generates cash value is because it buys death benefit. And sure, base buys death benefit, but so does PUA. And in so doing, by through the payment of base premium, you eventually generate cash value. What I encourage you to do is to start thinking of the, in terms of the quality of your authority to pay PUA. There's a phrase you've never heard before, unless you're a client of mine. The quality of your authority. As I've said, uh, I think I said in an earlier lecture, uh, the terms and conditions governing your ability to pay PUA varies fairly dramatically company to company. Right, I mentioned in this lecture that uh, some companies require PUA premium to be paid at the same time in a given year as your base premium. So there's a restriction on the timing of your PUA premium. Uh, there are other, other forms of restrictions. Some companies will allow you to vary your PUA between a minimum and a maximum one year to the next. Other companies will restrict how much you can vary your PUA in one year to the next. And the degrees of restriction can vary dramatically. Uh, it just, I, I know there's agents watching, <laughs> so I add, I add this last point. I, I think if you're an agent, you gotta be able to explain why cash value grows. And maybe you can do a better job than me. Uh, but I, I don't think there's a way around understanding cash value without going into present values, future cash flows, net present values, ongoing costs. But those four growth factors are crucial. All right, next time, we're going to talk about modified endowment contracts, what they are, how to prevent them. By the way, uh, there's two ways uh, within the confines of the IBC discussion. There are two ways to prevent uh, the modified endowment contract. And then we'll talk about term writers. There are various, there are different types of term. And nothing wrong with term in general, but there are, uh, generally speaking, three types. And I only use one of them. That could change in the future. There could be particular use cases where one of the other two types is appropriate, uh, but particularly for IBC, for a long-term oriented cash value growth mentality, I think one of the three is appropriate. Ryan, tell us which one it is. Watch the next lecture. <laughs> and then, of course, we'll go into the trade-offs between the three kinds. And you might agree with me, and you might disagree with me. But uh, hopefully you'll come away with a better understanding of why you uh, agree or disagree in the first place. All right, y'all. Hope you had fun, and we'll see you next time.